Okay, here we have the Charleston painting, uh, beautiful angel in the middle, it looks like uh, Fort Sumner, the jewel in the bottom right corner, and uh, a lion and a skull with a peninsula on it that is absolutely going to be Charleston, South Carolina. And this is verse number six. Starts out of all the romance retold, men of tales and tunes, cruel and bold, seen here by eyes of old, stand and listen to the birds, hear the cool, clear sound of water, and hearken to the words. This section of the poem leads us downtown to Washington Square, between Chalmers Street and Broad Street. The cobblestones on Chalmers Street are clearly represented in the wings of the angel. The stones are located on the upper wings of the angel, but not on the lower wings. I believe that's because Broad Street does not have cobblestones. Washington Square has three iron gates, and they all have similar butterfly patterns as to the wings of the angel in the picture. The main monument in the park is an obelisk, and it's also represented in the painting. The obelisk has Fort Sumner as well as some other battles and people written on the bottom of it. Washington Square also has two other monuments, one on each side of the obelisk. Just like the face painting, red, white, and blue represents the statue of George Washington on the left, and the star is represented by General Beauregard on the right. He fought in both the Mexican-American Wars and the Civil War. Next we have Hearken to the Words, Freedom at the Birth of a Century, or May the 13th. That's going to be the Spanish-American War, uh, where Cuba was given independence, America took the Spanish territories, and also got uh, the Philippines and Puerto Rico. Next we have Edwin and Edwina named after him, or on the eighth of scene. It's going to be Edwin Booth. His daughter was Edwina, and he was the brother of John Wilkes Booth. I believe the eighth of scene is going to be September the 8th, 1863, after the second battle at Fort Sumner, in which three Charleston forts were pounded for over a month and a half. Now let's find a treasure cask. Between two arms extended, below the bar that binds. Beside the long palm shadow embedded in the sand, waits fair remuneration, White House close at hand. As you can see in the picture, there are extensions of the fence all along the edges. They are the arms extended. Below the bar that binds is a two foot long, three quarter inch bar that locks this gate. In the shadow of a long palm buried in the sand waits fair remuneration, the parking meter. Yes, the parking meter is the fair remuneration. The White House close at hand. There's a White House about 15 feet to the left. A couple other finishing notes. The eyes of the painting sort of resemble the windows on the courthouse. And the bottom of the gate resembles the triangles in the jewel, as well as the mouth of the... Uh, statue monument in the painting. It is actually the palm tree that is embedded in the sand and not the jewel. The limb in the painting that wanders through under the angel's wings actually comes off of an oak tree 30 feet away and extends just over this gate. It's also possible that a scene on the 8th is meant to be represented by the jewel hanging from the tree limb, talking about uh, 49 pirates being hung on December the 8th in 1718. And finally the lion's head so prominently placed in the painting. The house on the northeast corner of Washington Square is the German Friendly Society and they've occupied that house for over 200 years. With so much of this puzzle surrounding slavery and the time period for the Civil War, it's clear to me that Africa and West Africa are the primary immigrants after the Civil War, they dispersed all over the country because Charleston had pretty much been destroyed. In General Sherman's official account, I doubt any city was ever more terribly punished than Charleston, but as her people had for years agitated for war and discord and finally inaugurated the Civil War, the judgment of the world will be that Charleston deserved the fate that befell her.